No other name, no other reason, in Christ alone. Ah. We have uh, such a precious worship team. So thank you, worship team. So many different men and women that love to sing the praises of the Lord. And thank you, thank you. Thank you for a pastor that cares and shepherds them musically. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, Dwayne. In Christ alone, we had a conference. Conference is over. No, it just began. And uh, this is the Sunday after the conference when we have a chance to really look back a little bit and... Uh, some of you were not able to be here for your schedules or different things, and uh, you know, I, that's good. That's okay. And many of you were here. And uh, Pastor George Grace came and preached the Word of God. Again, our worship team and the singing and instruments and the support personnel behind the scenes, all the people that do the technical stuff and make people successful. I love what they do and how they do it, and they are... Uh, not people that want any accolades. They just want to know that the name of Jesus has been glorified and honored and extolled and exalted. And that's all we have done and continue to do at First Bible Baptist Church. In Christ alone, a missions conference theme. In Christ alone. Pastor Grace did mention something that really can help you. Go, Why, why would you do that for a missions conference? Well, if you read this. You'll capture the heart of your pastor and where I'm at. Uh, maybe if not, you capture my heart that deeply, at least in the words. I'm conveying a message. It says, of course, a message from Pastor Mark. And uh, that really, I'll reference that maybe a couple of times in, in some of the words there in our message this morning. You also have a commitment card that came along with that brochure. Hopefully, again, you have a copy of that. And uh, if you don't, grab one in the, uh, in the foyer, in the, in the lobby. A commitment card is something like this. It's a little smaller than that. And on the back of it, it says, fill out your Acts 1-8 Missions Conference commitment card for 2023 and what we will be committed to in missions for the upcoming year. We support a great deal of missionaries, over 30, right, Randy? We got it pretty good. And we're getting better at memorizing them all, but there is a group of people, by the way, every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. that gathers and prays for our missionaries. We give to our missionaries on a monthly basis as well. We've committed all, nearly $8,000 to missionaries because of your generous offerings and your generous giving above and beyond your tithe. So continue to do that, pray about that. We'd love to take our commitments between now and the end of the year so we know what to do. Uh, with our commitments to missionaries on a monthly basis. And then there is a second one there, special offering for our pastoral staff that may generate some questions. Good. I'm glad it does. You want to know what that's all about? Would you like me to tell you? You're going to have to come next Sunday, okay? Because I'm going to speak about this next Sunday in detail, thoroughly. It'll be the first and I don't know if it'll be the only time that I'm going to speak on a Sunday morning about uh, what God has done in your ministry in regards to how we have supported missionaries and ministers, how we take care of the men and women here that serve, obviously, especially your pastors and their families. And so that's very, very important. I have never really brought that to you on a Sunday and said things. Uh, it won't be necessarily a financial report. It's going to be a Bible report on how things are working and how we've been able to navigate everything the last 10 years together as I've been the lead pastor. Are there anybody, is there anybody in here, are any of you without a commitment card and would like one, would you raise your hand and somebody will come and, and capture that? Raise your hand real quick, keep it up in the air, and they will be able to come and get you. See, Mil you can still move pretty fast, can't you? Anybody else? Commitment cards. Anybody else? Raise your hand, and they will get one to you so that you have one. Everybody else set. So now you know what that commitment card is all about. Again, the brochure. Make sure that you grab one of those cards and pray over it. Make sure that you look at this 
a little brochure and say, oh, well, the conference is over. Well, yeah, we did all this. But now you open it up and you go, oh, a message from the pastor. Ah, well, that, okay, that might carry us through. I better hold me accountable to that. But here you go. The missionaries that we support on a monthly basis, you want to pray for them? I don't know who they are. You are now without excuse. Grab one of them in the lobby. If you don't, or there's run out or something like that, I'll give you mine. I've got four or five of them stashed over there. Usually I'll wallpaper one of my walls with them. No, I have a couple extra if you need one. Please pick one up and pray for our missionaries. Okay, by name. And if you have any questions about any of the missionaries and the work they're doing, we have a missions pastor. He's full-time on church staff. We pay him about a quarter of a million dollars a year. That stopped us from being able to give to missionaries, so now we give it to him, and he gives it to the missionaries. Just kidding. Randy works for the Lord and for himself, and Linda, of course, married a multimillionaire, so that's really, really cool how that's worked out. He will tell you how the missionaries are doing. He will give you a report any time because we have a mission support team and also a missions prayer team that are constantly in contact with missionaries. Right, Patty Williams? I didn't get my, I didn't get my hug today. I didn't get my hug today from Jose. Okay, Jose sends me a hug every week. These are things that really mean something. And again, you can come out of a missions conference and go, oh, what do I do next? Well, first of all, you can live in Christ alone. How's that sound? That's what we're going to speak about. Go to uh, the Song of Solomon in your Old Testament, and that's where we're going to start today. Um, you have 30 seconds to get there. Everybody look in your table of contents in the front. All with you with electronic Bibles, you're cheating, okay? <laughs> but they work, so that's good. I'm on page 871 in my Bible, if that will help you at all. If anybody has a Bearing Precious Sea Bible, you'll know that's the one that I use to preach in and preach out of. Use those for a lot of years. How's your AFib doing today? Pretty good? Your heart's still beating? He's got that look, Becky, you know. I know. Father, take care of my buddy again and again. I've entitled our message, A Sermon from Sermons. A Sermon from Sermons. I only prepared five minutes, took all of George Grace's notes, and that's what you're getting today. Just kidding. I've spent the whole week preparing. And I said, well, then I sure hope this message is good. You didn't preach last Sunday. I sure hope it is too. Please, God. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. George is a tough act to follow, but he gave us spirit-filled and spirit-led messages from the Word of God. So I'm going to use the Word of God, and I've asked the Spirit of God to do the same. He started out in Christ alone in our theme with the Song of Solomon. So today I'm going to just walk through for the next few minutes some of the notes that I took down, some of the things that God struck, with, struck me with. Of course, if you... And I don't know, Christine, I didn't ask you before this. Can you pull up that, that slide and just put it up there with the QR code? Um, we have, First Bible ADP, a YouTube channel. If you go to the YouTube channel, you can simply go there, grab one of George's messages. It says Song of Solomon, number one, two, three, whatever. And then you go to description and you can click on the link. Or you can take your phone right now, grab that QR code, and it'll take you right to them, and you'll have all the slides and a PDF version to be able to follow along. You will need those over time for different times. Let me review and go back to that message that Pastor George Grace preached on when it talked out of Colossians 3. Well, I'm going to review that this morning and some highlights there or some things that God put in my heart. But again, you have the opportunity to be able to get 
deeper in the Word of God as far as you want to go. If you have no desire for notes from Doc Clemma's lesson or Bobby Bonner's lesson and messages of Steve, whoever's teaching the Bible in dis, uh, discipleship hour, you guys get this beautiful notebook of everything that's being taught. You come to a Bible Institute course, you get all these notes, 100, 200, 300 pages of notes for Institute courses. You can do anything you want with it. I would hope that you would study when it comes to the deity of Christ, oh, I don't know how to prove that Jesus Christ is God. There are slides that are perfectly well-written notes in this message when you click on the QR code or use that link. And then you can go and you're sitting down with somebody and say, how can I prove that Jesus Christ is God? Pull it up on your phone, it takes you 30 seconds. May I take you to this passage? And may I take you to this passage? And let me use the Bible. What are you getting pulling up your phone for? Because it has Bible notes on it. That would really be nice. Because it does say, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can have a bookshelf full of a bunch of notes and you never take them off. They're useless. These are useful to you if you use them. You didn't know I was that smart that I could use that kind of English language. They are useful if you use them. And here we, ha here we are in our A Sermon of Sermons, and we have the QR code. You have all that. A number of you are grabbing them. And you'll be able to say, okay, how did this conference go? What went on in the messages? Well, there was, again... Some wonderful singing, some wonderful songs, uh, uh, special songs. Milt finished it out with just a tremendous song. Everybody, the singers and, and all the prayers that went on. The gatherings at the coffee house were super califragilistic expialidocious. Even though the sound of it, anyway, stop, stop. They were fantastic. They were just tremendous. And you heard from each one of these men about their commitment to the Lord, their surrender to the Lord, and their desire to follow him to the end. Oh, that's just for them. It's for all of us. That's why your pastor puts them in front of you. So that maybe God will use a word that they say to speak to you about getting on the will of God for your life. Which, of course, George Grace spoke about. The Song of Solomon, chapter number 5. I'm going to start here. I'm going to read nine verses and get our message off the ground in Christ alone, a sermon of sermons. Now let's just grab a tiny bit of insight, continue, I'm thinking and continue in this theme of in Christ alone. We think about the Solomon Psalm and go, why in the world did George Grace end up here? This surprised me as much as anyone, but now I can... I can see why, because it is the most beautiful love story in the whole wide world. It's God's love story for us. It's God's love story for his church. It's God's love story for Israel in the Old Testament, Jehovah and Israel, the church and Jesus Christ. Of course, an allegory. It has symbolism throughout, and it's God's espoused right of Christ that he's speaking of. The husband here, which is Solomon, he is, of course, one of the main characters. The Shulamite woman, this is one of his wives. It was joked about, but I don't know if it's really to be joked about. This is a precious wife, in fact, the precious wife of Solomon. And he did have 700 wives and 300 concubines, and it could be said he didn't know anything about marriage, or he did know a lot about marriage. And when it comes down to it, this passage of Scripture in the Song of Solomon is pointing to the love relationship of a man and a woman, which again is the symbolism, the allegory, part of how this intertwines into God's love for his church with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The husband speaks to his wife. The wife speaks about him and of him, but he is not present any longer. And then the daughters of Jerusalem come into play. And the daughters of Jerusalem are who she asks to go find this husband. And George pulled it together. And so I'll just say it up front. If you didn't hear it or you've heard it, then it's good to hear it again and again. What is so great about your husband is the question that the daughters of Jerusalem ask the Shulamite woman. What is so great about him? It really comes down to what is so great about your husband, church? 
What is so great about your husband, believer? As the bride of Christ, he is our husband. What is so great about Jesus Christ to you? Now with that as a backdrop, let me read. Follow along in verse number one. Here's Solomon speaking. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink ye, drink abundantly, O beloved. He's coming to her door to meet with her. He's romantically drawn to her. He wants to be with her. It's a beautiful picture of the Lord that wants to be with his bride. Verse 2, she now speaks. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? She has prepared herself for bed. She has prepared herself gloriously and beautifully to be alone in her bed. But her husband has come and he wants to be with her. It's beautiful. She is at her best here, she's saying. Verse number four. My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and by and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open my beloved, open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. It was struck to me as that passage was being read, and Pastor Grace was reading it last Sunday. I said, he wanted her to know it was him and no other. She could identify him by the myrrh, by what he had left on the door on the other side of the keyhole. She didn't think of anyone else but him, and he did not want it to be any doubt that it was him at the door. It's beautiful. Verse number six, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. He was there for a moment. There was evidence that he was there by what he had left behind in his myrrh, in his smell, and how his fingers had touched the handle. By the way, all of you wives that are upset at your husbands for wearing too much cologne, eh, it's probably not a good idea to complain to him. You know it's him. Just wear the one that I like. Okay? That's what he did. It's a beautiful thought. The sweet smelling savor. Ah, oh, it goes up to the Lord. Now he brings it. Now watch what happens in 7, 8, and 9. The watchmen then went about the city, found me, they smote me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I'm going out, I'm looking, and, and I, I'm exposed to, to, to the people out there. And he says, and she says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if ye find my beloved, that ye tell him that I am sick of love. I'm lovesick for him. I need to find him. And they return in verse number 9, a great set of questions. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? She is desperate and she is charging those that are closest to her the daughters of Jerusalem in proximity. Go, find him. I need to be with him. Now, Father in heaven, this has just been a beautiful week in Christ alone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for being so gracious and so kind. We trust in you and you deliver we believe in what you can do, and you come through. 
We have faith in the next thing because of your resume of being faithful all these years in our lives, individually and as a church. So I pray this morning as we grab a hold of some thought, grab a hold of scripture, grab a hold of the sermons that have been preached and how things have gone through by how you use Pastor George Grace, that you will use this morning for the people under the voice of your word to grasp a deeper understanding of in Christ alone. I thank you for this passage and all the others that we are to endeavor to get into. And I thank you for what a great week again that we've had. We ask you to, to give us some more, as only you can, by your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. That verse out there resonates, doesn't it? What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Oh, thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? Why? Why? What is so beautiful? What is so wonderful? What is so great about your son, Jesus Christ, dear Father? What is so great? What is so wonderful? What is so incredible about the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit? who speaks of and glorifies the name of Jesus. Church, what is so incredible about our husband as we are his bride? Personally speaking again, what is so incredible about Jesus Christ to you? What is incredible about him to you? There's three people speaking, of course, here. I mentioned them. Solomon, the Shulamite woman, the daughters of Jerusalem. It is a romantic study, as we mentioned. What is it about Jesus that makes him so special? Would you chase after Jesus Christ like she's chasing after her husband? In your romantic part of your life, husband and wife, just speaking to you, so heavily convicted about this last Sunday. What kind of husband am I? Am I a godly husband? A husband that wants to go after his wife? Is my wife and I and my picture of how I as the bride would go after my husband Jesus, that I treat my relationship with my wife like that? Would I chase after Jesus in the community? Do I chase after him on my daily walk with the Lord in the right way? Do I go after him? What is so great about your husband, Jesus Christ? What is so great about him? I continue to ask you. Maybe, maybe it is that in this study of Song of Solomon, where we learn so many beautiful things about this love relationship. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot. Maybe we just don't study it much. But if we did, what would we find out? We would find out the beautiful, beautiful allegory, the beautiful, beautiful story, the pictures of God's love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you're lost this morning, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. If you have never bowed your knee in your heart to Jesus Christ, I implore you to realize that Jesus Christ and being pictured here in the Song of Solomon and all the other passages is the one that the church is married to. That in your personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you will pick up this espoused relationship where you will be taken up with his love as you love him. So I ask believers, are you lovesick over Jesus Christ? Are you lovesick over him? Are we as a church lovesick over him? The Acts 1-8 conference this year brings a solid, contemplative, and convicting question for us as one body and spirit. How will we continue accomplishing 
our church's mission. When this question is asked of each church family member, it is paramount that the answer reveals a unified heart throughout the partnership of our church family. The success of the mission of First Bible Baptist Church rises and falls on our decision to collectively choose to accomplish everything in Christ alone. George said, and I remember, I think I, I will quote it closely, and oftentimes I'll say things from my note-taking, the success and proficiency of our Christianity personally depends on our view of Christ. That is a corporate and collective thought of this question. How will we together continue accomplishing our church's mission? It's got to be in Christ alone. The success of your walk, the proficiency of your walk as a Christian depends on your view of Christ. How do you view him? He saved my soul. I'm happy about that. As it was spoken of Sunday, and I would concur, we preach and we teach. Many of you teach the Bible. Many of you do Bible lessons with people. Many of you teach in gatherings at First Bible Baptist Church or in Sunday groups or in small groups or uh, on Wednesday night studies in the Bible Institute. I wonder if it is more prevalent then we want to realize that Jesus is added as an afterthought and not as the main thought sometimes, maybe a lot of times. Maybe when we teach, we, we know we're in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word and the living Word, but do we really, truly put Him in the center of things? Well, that's how we got off the ground last Sunday. The Song of Solomon, what is so great about your husband what is so great about Jesus Christ? Go to Hebrews chapter number one. We next went to Hebrews chapter number one. And he came right in through the side door on this one and talked about, of course, the excellency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read the first three or four verses. In fact, of course, we had a little study in this months back called Be Better. And I did not tell George that we had done any of that. So for him even to go here was really just neat. And, and it must be that God wants us to reinforce the truth and the principles of how we can be better in the excellency of the majesty, Jesus Christ. It says in verse number one of Hebrews chapter number one, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, he didn't have anybody helping him, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better, so much better than angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Again, in those notes, you'll have so much in there on the outline of the book of Hebrews and so much, but I just grabbed this list of seven excellencies, the sevenfold excellency of Jesus Christ. You see it up on the screen. Jesus is appointed heir of all things, obviously found in verse number two, made the worlds, verse number two, you say, who created the world? I think it was just God and not Jesus. There's a deity verse, of course, as we get into the deity Christ here in a minute. He made the worlds. Jesus is the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the express image of his person. He is, in and of himself, God, but yet he is in God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, as the triune God. His sevenfold excellencies continued. Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus by himself purged our sins. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ himself, which goes back to the Song of Solomon. As the Shulamite woman, the espoused one, says, I rose up to open my up to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh. Upon the handles of the lock I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but, I, but he gave me no answer. This is the one, Jesus Christ, who the excellencies are all about. God himself wrote about his son himself. Jesus Christ, 
What a resume Christ has. And it so happens that he, Jesus, had his resume written by his Father and by the Holy Spirit. It's pretty powerful. This is written to the Jews to make them turn to Jesus Christ, to know that Jesus is better, that his superiority is clear, and of course, for the Jews to know he is Messiah. He is Messiah. He's better. He's superior. He is Messiah. Do you realize, do I realize, how much we have in Jesus? We need to be reminded constantly because we forget. We sing a song like, what a friend we have in Jesus. When we sing the songs that we sung this morning, what a powerful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Whew. In light of that, just very simple statement, Jesus Christ, is he my all in all? Jesus Christ, do I see him as better? Or have I just resigned myself to the fact that it's nice to be saved? I'm doing fine. My life is good enough. Then it behooved this statement that George made more than once. Good enough. It is the enemy of the best. Maybe many of us are missing out on a life in Christ that is the best that he has for us. Not the best that the world would look at when it comes to, hey, all of our monies and all of our possessions in this world. No. The best life in Christ is found in Christ alone and being acquainted with his griefs, going through his sufferings. Maybe it's like Paul the Apostle that said he was buffeted. A messenger of Satan showed up on him as Cindy is reading that verse in the, earlier during our praise and worship time. And he asked for it to be taken away, and it was not. Maybe that's part of it. Oh, my life is good enough. I don't need it to be anymore. I would say this. In order for us to stop the good enough, we must believe what the Bible says, what God says, and don't come up with that phrase, um, everything but that. I like all of that, but accept this. And, and, you know, I see what God says, except I just have a problem with this. So I wonder now, coming back to another statement that was made, do you have a desire to be better than you are today? The desire. That was made a statement last Sunday. We want to walk out of here on Wednesday after our conference to be better. I want you to walk out after 45, 50 minutes of a preaching message plus 20 minutes of singing praises unto the Lord after a time maybe of invitation and prayer. And maybe it's whatever the pieces go into our Sunday morning gathering and worship. I want you to be better when you leave. Maybe it's just a fellowship. Someone just came up and said, hey, I hope you have an awesome Sunday. I hope that you really have a better week than you had last week. Well, I had a great week last week. Well, I hope you have the best week that you ever had the next week. Do you have a desire? God places us in the spot and the places that he'd have us to be for his glory. We ought to embrace that better in excellency and superiority in Christ that takes us through all that in Christ alone. Do you have a desire to be better than you are? Or are you simply just aware of the fact that you need to be and you don't want to be? I wonder. Desire is huge. Desire is so, so big. First Timothy chapter number 3. We go into the deity of Christ. You can't get a, a more beautiful and more well-written <laughs> passage about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider that in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, there's a layout here of the office of a leader in church, a bishop, a deacon, and how that they are supposed to be the wives of those deacons, the wives of those bishops, how things are supposed to be. And he goes through this incredibly convicting list, but also it's a high bar. It's Jesus in the church 
And Paul's saying, Timothy, if you're going to find some people to lead, this is what they need to be like. He then comes all the way through that and says, oh, yeah, there's some other pieces and parts to all of this. Um, no, that's not plural. It, there's only one piece and part to all of this at the root of it, and that's Jesus Christ. Verse number 13, before we get to 16. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's what I would like to see in our deacons. Great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote that to Timothy. Dr. Luke wrote it in Acts chapter number 6. Full of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of wisdom. The deacon is supposed to be sitting up on as much as anything a boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. He continues in verse 14. These things write I unto you, excuse unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. If I don't make it to remind you one on one, let me just remind you how you're supposed to behave in the church of God, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Why? Because verse number 16, which is so beautiful, it's so beautiful, so perfect in its scripture. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. That's Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider the godness of Jesus Christ in Christ alone. Jesus means God is salvation or Savior, correct? Christ means Messiah, Old Testament, anointed New Testament. Jesus Christ, the anointed Savior. That's who you are believing in to be saved. That is who lives inside. That's who works inside. That's who's the living word of God to work inside of you in Christ alone. What a powerful passage of scripture. Jesus Christ is God and that's settled. It's a fundamental Bible doctrine. But it's attacked by most major cults and false religions. Why? If I can get Jesus Christ and I be God, I can have anything I want. I can justify myself in anything that I do. I can go ahead and have my own, kind of, my own kind of religion, my own kind of cult. I can get people to follow me, and after they follow me, I take Jesus Christ out of the picture, or I mention him to be a little bit. He's a, he's a good prophet. He, he was a wonderful guy. He taught a lot of good stories. He is God. John eight fifty eight says this. Jesus himself said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Besides the fact that he gave you all the statements about I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but my me. I am the door, John chapter number 10. I am the bread of life, John chapter number 6. I am the good shepherd, John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14. I am the light, John 8. I am the resurrection, John 11. I am the vine, the true vine, John 15. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So he's called Lord. He's master. He's God. He is not just a man that walked the earth, though he was the son of man. He is God. Completely, 100% God. The proof of Jesus Christ as a self-existent one found, is found throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. He, he is self-existent. He didn't have to somebody make him. He has been in the beginning, and he will always be. He's Jesus Christ. He is God. When you reference those notes on the site, again, they are some of the very best notes you're ever going to find. The whole outline of the book of Hebrews that you get. All the notes about Hebrews. The outline of the deity of Christ and the list upon list about how Jesus was able to forgive man's sin. Jesus had creative powers. Jesus received worship due only to God. These are things that are attributed to God that were attributed to Jesus Christ, which means he is God. Verse after verse after verse after verse. I've never done that before. I've never looked. Well, somebody did it for you, so go ahead and grab the notes and go study them yourself and go memorize a few things. It would really help you a lot. Why do you think you suggest to someone who's a new believer to read the Gospel of John? Who is Jesus in the Gospel of John? Yell it out. He is God. Completely 100%. Go read it. 
If you're wondering whether or not you want Jesus Christ as Savior, go read it. He'll speak to you, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and tell you. And if you get a little bit uh, muddled up there, just go read the book of Romans. That'll straighten you right out. You can't miss the Romans and the Gospel of John. You can't miss them. Why do we put together over the years scriptures and we did the Gospel of John and the Gospel, of, I mean, in the, in the letter to the Romans? Juan y Romanos. Because those two books are paramount. They're the bookends of what you need to know for your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and know that he is the self-existent one. Our eternal life is from God. There is no other name but Jesus Christ. Is there any other name but Jesus Christ to be saved by? Our brother, Pastor Dwayne, was praying that through when he was praying at the end of our worship time to come in to pray, to, to, to preaching the word of God. Acts chapter number four. You can go there. It's up on the screen. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Real quick, just real simple. Just keep in mind this. In Acts chapter number four, it starts out with Peter and John still finishing up their preaching message. It says that 5,000 men get saved. That's after they healed the lame man who was at the gate. Now consider, all these people that came to Jesus Christ and believed on him as deity in the resurrection, there was also those people that were the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, the Sadducees. They wanted them put in jail. The Roman soldiers weren't trying to put them in jail. All the religious mucky mucks that know everything about God and Messiah and the Old Covenant, they were missing the mark and they didn't love this man named Jesus. They rejected him as deity. They rejected him as God. They rejected him as the Savior of the world. And they put him in jail. They held on to him. They didn't hold on to him long. They got out of there. And then they went after it preaching some more. And the Bible says they were of one heart and one soul later on in chapter number four. That they spoke with great grace and great power. Whew! That's Jesus. There's no name to be saved other than Jesus, but there's no other way to live but by Jesus in Christ alone. So here's your last two messages in six minutes. You ready? Here we go. Go to Colossians chapter number three. Since we've already been studying this and knowing it, okay, Colossians chapter number three and then Philippians chapter number three. I think that's a pretty good coincidence. No, I don't think so. I think that it's on purpose. Colossians 3, verse number 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, in your, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Love that statement. You're dead, but you're alive, and you're hid with Christ in God. Woo. Verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. This is truly, as I said in the, the message from Pastor Mark, how will we love others in the temple and house to house? We'll review, reveal our trust in God. How we live faith will demonstrate our commitment to God's word and the Holy Spirit. How we declare hope will reveal our burden for souls who need the gospel. This is how it happens in Christ alone, thinking about Jesus Christ all the time. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, i got to think about him. Well, I've got other things to do. He can be in the back of your mind. How is it that all those other things are in the back of your mind while you're sitting right here hearing the preaching of the word of God? Why don't you flip it? Flip it. Flip it away. You got all kinds of things. When is he going to be done? When is he going to be done? Uh, it's 1130 something. Oh, I don't know. He's going to do it. He goes over time. I can't believe he's going to do it. I got food. I got something in the oven. Flip it around. Flip it around. Here we go. So everything that's going on in your life, Jesus Christ is right there. Right here. Right there. The reason I have a big tummy is so that I can contain more of Jesus Christ. Is that biblical? Is that biblical? It's not biblical. Am I stretching? Okay. Yeah. But I think, and I'm just going to use a simple one. I'm just, it's a simple, just a 10 second illustration. Does anybody ever get hungry when they're in church? <laughs> right now? <laughs> Turn it around to the hunger for Jesus Christ. So I've never heard that one before. Of course you have. 
I stole it from another preacher. Now listen, listen. When you think about this simple statement, it is a collective decision by all of us to do this together. We're complete in him. It's up on the screen. Just two quick verses. We're complete in him. George read this verse. Verse number 10, and ye are complete in him. Chapter 2, verse 10, which is the head of all principality and power. i got to read this for you. I'm just going to let it speak to you. Let it speak to you. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. You are immersed in him. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. Buried in the likeness of Christ's death. Raised in the likeness of resurrection. That is a picture of what happens when you get saved. By holy God. You are now complete in him and you're spiritually circumcised. You say, I've heard that a few times. I just didn't know where to find it. Write it down in your notes. Because it ties together with verse number four. He says there in verse number four, chapter number three, who, when Christ, who is our life? Which means you're alive. And you're going to have eternal life and live in glory. Ah! That's right. You're complete in him. Oh, let me just give you the Armenian view and the Calvinist view. <laughs> Seriously? How are you going to undo that one? The deity of Jesus Christ runs into the place where I'm going to submit to Jesus Christ. Because he is all in all. Now, from this conference, we live in Christ alone. We do mission in Christ alone. We walk out in the sports park in Christ alone. We do things one by one, two by two. We do one by one discipleship in Christ alone. We get together in the vesters in Christ alone. We pray in Christ alone. This is it. There's no other place to go but in Christ alone. Can't add more, subtract more. What's the next theme? This is it. There's nothing left. Read the end of the story. Open up to Revelation 22. Read the beginning of it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There was not form of the earth. The earth. They were there. They started it all. And they're going to end it all. And then we're going to be in glory with him. Is there anything more? My heart's getting a little bit. I'm not going to cover this because of time, but look at the next slide. What we seek and why. That's verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Why we seek and why we, what we seek and why was covered in the first, first four verses, right? But then I added put off the old man and put on the old, uh, new man. So what do we got? What we seek and why, first four verses. Then put off the old man and put on the new man, found in your notes. Again, you can get them. I put it up there as a review slide where you can go, well, what should we seek above? Jeru New Jerusalem, the eternal truths of the word of God, they're all right there. Why should we seek them? Because we died with Christ. This is it. We put off the old man and we put on the new man, which goes down five through nine. Put him off. The old guy, put him off. The new guy, put him on. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with the deeds, and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. Look, those first, the five through eight, five through nine, those are the sexual sins, the personal attitude sins, and the sins aimed at fellow believers. All three sin groups are wrong, and they are totally against the will of God. In Christ alone, we can still mess up in our flesh. Let's put it down and put it off. Put all these off. Anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, put off also too that sexual sins of fornication, uncleanness, and ordinance. Like George said, this is a typical sin message category right here from a Baptist preacher at a Baptist church. I'm just giving you a three-minute version of it. The bottom line is, this is how bad you are in your flesh. You need to be saved. If you're born again this, this day and you know, you're, you, you know Jesus Christ is saving and you're spiritually circumcised, that flesh will still come up and get you. It'll still mess with you. It'll cause you to say things you never meant to say. You will act in anger. You will act in malice. You will be someone who does not forgive. And he goes down and he says, you know what? You know what you need to do? You need to lie not one to another, seeing you put, on the old, put off the old man and put on the new guy. 
And when you put on the new guy, what do you do? You forgive and you forbear. Verse number 11, 12, and 13. Clean things up, George said, because he's worth it. Clean it up. Clean things up. Clean things up. And he came to that last verse, verse number 14. And he used that little illustration of faith, hope, and charity. These are the three greatest. And the greatest of these is charity. Faith. It's over here in the past part of how God shows you very simply, I've proven myself faithful the whole time through my word and through my power and through my sovereignty. You can rely and have your faith built on me being God from the beginning to the end. I've always been God. Hope. Hope is built over here is your future. It's how you think future-wise in Jesus Christ alone. In that whole thinking, all George said was very simple. That you and I are promised a place in glory with Jesus Christ. Verse number four. The charity part is who you are right now. How do you live today? Verse number 14 tells me how to live. And above all these things, put on charity. There's a whole study. That's, that's a whole preaching message which is the bond of perfectness. It's a bond. Have you ever made a bond with someone? Have you ever made a blood vow and a blood bond and you cut your skin and did that? That is something that an old, we won't get into all that and the ramifications of that. I'm just saying this, a bond used to be a handshake and a word, correct? That's my bond. That's what God did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, Philippians chapter number 3. If you want to go there, you can. I'm going to put this verse up on the screen. We're going after the mark. It says up there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For us guys in a men's conference, we had this as a theme, I think, two, three, four years ago. Press toward the mark. What a great theme. I believe Brian Hedges, we had him in and broke that all down for us. What George did in bringing this message here is very simple. As the collective, the congregation, the church, we must be one. All deciding that I'm not going to follow after the things that I used to follow after. I'm going to follow after the one that apprehended me. What happens when a cop apprehends you? They capture you. He says, I want to go apprehend Jesus Christ. Back to Song of Solomon. Why is your... Beloved, so beloved. I need to go get him. I need to go find him. All Paul is saying is, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press to the mark of the prize of the high calling. He then listed so many things. Again, they're in notes. He listed six different things that really would show us from the scriptures what it would be like to press toward the mark. I realize that I must have a dissatisfaction with just being right in this spot and not growing. I need to realize that I need to be dedicated to Jesus Christ. I need to get direction from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 13. Verse number 14, I press, which means being determined. I then have this discipline found in verse number 16. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. That's the same direction. Same determination. Then I had this discipline, and then, of course, I had this incredible desire. I mentioned it earlier. Do you want to fulfill the will of God for your life? Then it all comes back to this question. How many of you know that you can do better? Can you do better? So the question that was part of it is, do you want to? Do you want to? How many of you know that you can do better? That was that question. And it all came back around to Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 9. She wanted her husband. Do you want Jesus Christ? Do you want him to make things better? If you're lost, do you want him as Savior? If you're saved, do you want him to take your life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee? It comes back to love sick. What will it take for his bride? What will it take for us, his bride, to be 
and love sake for our husband. Maybe there was a time where you were lovesick for him and not so much. Maybe right now you are so lovesick for him. Hallelujah. Or maybe there's really never been a time where you say, I'm really, I've been saved and born again, but I don't know if I've ever been lovesick for my husband, Jesus. Church, I want us to be lovesick together for Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Now this is a precious time and we'll take a few minutes maybe, but I'm going to pray for you as you bow your heads and close your eyes. Our sound tech is going to put on a song in the background for you to listen to. I'm going to ask you again, what will it take for us, his bride, to be lovesick for our husband, Jesus Christ? Our Father in heaven, we've laid out a lot in your word, and I thank you for your son again, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, again for just doing all that you do as our mediator and what you have done already and what you will do for us in glory. You are everything. You are our all in all. We are complete in you. And we think about how as we are complete in you. There's no other reason to add or subtract or take away. We just need to be lovesick for you. I pray that you'll work in this invitation time, in this prayer time, in every one of those believers that are here, those that are lost. God, work in them as well, that you would have your way into their lives. In Jesus' name, please stand. Please stand.